We will now go to Mr. Leposky. Uh, Mr. Leposky, welcome back uh, to Yuma. It's you great have, to be here. You have uh, five minutes or so. Uh, you have the floor, Mr. Leposky. The uh, federal government is to be heartily congratulated for deciding that Canada needs accessibility legislation to make this a barrier-free country for over six million people with disabilities. The federal government's also to be heartily congratulated for agreeing that we need new legislation to lift hundreds of thousands of people with disabilities out of poverty, which they do not deserve to suffer from. However, the Accessible Canada Act, like the Canada Disability Benefit Act, have both proven themselves to be strong on good intentions, but extremely poor in implementation and impact. I invite you, as part of this review, to ask key questions. Since the Accessible Canada Act was passed in uh, 2019, have we made 25% of the progress we need to make towards the goal the Act sets, a barrier-free Canada, by 2040, since we've now used up 25% of the time? What disability barriers has this act caused to be removed? What steps need to be taken to get us to that goal since this act is not working to achieve its goal with the force and effect that is needed? What are the problems? The Act does not at present require any disability barrier to ever be removed or prevented in any organization that the federal government can regulate. Not one single accessibility standard that is enforceable in law has been enacted in the five years since this law was passed. As a result, progress towards accessibility has been glacial and agonizingly slow. I was invited to speak at a conference in Montreal last spring called Accessible Canada, Accessible World, with leaders on accessibility from across the country, obligated organizations, and the minister responsible. I don't recall anyone in their many speeches ever identifying a single barrier that has been removed in the past five years because it was required to be removed by this act. Now, there may be some out there somewhere, but we should have an impressive list after five years, not be struggling to maybe scurry and find a few. Now, I'm not saying nobody's doing anything either to implement the act or to address accessibility barriers. I am saying that the Accessible Canada Act is itself, as a matter of legal force, not significantly contributing towards its own goal. Its implementation and enforcement is labyrinthian because the law is outrageously complicated to read and even understand. I got two law degrees. I practiced law for over three decades. I now teach law part-time, and I I think I got a specialty in this area. I can't figure out what the damn thing says. And if I can't, I bet you can't either. And if you can't, I bet your obligated organizations are having a tough time. And if they're having a tough time, I bet people with disabilities are having at least that tough time. People with disabilities deserve better. Our brief offers you 10 amendments we need. We recommended all of these five years ago when this bill was before Parliament. Sadly, they were all turned down. Had they been accepted, we'd be in a better place. I'm going to mention a couple now. I invite your questions, if I get more time, to explain more. Number one, we need to impose a deadline on the government 
to pass at least one accessible standard that is enforceable by law, not a, not a voluntary guideline or standard that, that Accessible Standards Canada produces. That's thin rule. Nobody has to comply with it. One that's enforceable within one year and four more within two years. We ought to be able to do that at this point. Number two, this law's implementation and enforcement is splintered incoherently across three different organizations, the Accessibility Commissioner, the CRTC, the CTC, or CTA, pardon me. Those agencies are in a race to see who can go slowest. People with disabilities deserve better. Can we just have one one-stop shopping agency that will do it all? that will implement it all, that will enforce it all, that will bring the regs to cabinet to do it all. We have Accessible Standards Canada, but they can only give advice. It's a good start, but we've got to do way better. Get rid of this splintered, incoherent, unnavigable mess. It's good the Act requires obligated organizations to make accessibility plans and report on their progress. It doesn't require them to be any good. It doesn't require them to actually implement them. And we can't bring complaints, and those agencies can't enforce if the plans aren't any good or if the plans aren't enforced. Final point for this short part of our list, not one dollar of federal money should ever be used again to create new disability barriers. The Act doesn't require that. Its implementation doesn't require that. And as a result, the government is free to give out money to provinces and hospitals and others for infrastructure projects that can include disability barriers, and nothing is required in this act to stop it. People with disabilities deserve better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lepofsky. Uh, with that, we will begin with Ms. Gray, and again, if you would uh, identify yourself and specifically to each witness that you want to question. You have six minutes, Ms. Gray. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Tracy Gray. I'm the vice chair of this committee on behalf of the uh, conservative team, and I'm wearing a black blazer with a cream-colored blouse, and I have blonde shoulder-length hair. Uh, my first questions are for uh, Mr. Lepofsky. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you heard of the situation that occurred last week at this committee uh, where the House of Commons administration created a barrier for a person living with a disability from testifying virtually who said he had testified previously and within minutes of being notified of this my conservative colleagues and I took action we tabled a motion which passed uh, which was to ensure the person was able to testify and for House administration to do an immediate investigation and report back to this committee within a month my question for you is do you think think we can have a credible conversation about a Canada without barriers when even the highest government institution in the land parliament currently isn't without barriers? Governments often talk about, uh, of all political stripes, about the importance of their leading by example on accessibility. Now, we don't believe that anybody in the private sector needs to wait until the government gets it right. God knows, none of us are immortal. But it is especially important for government to get it right, especially at the core of democracy, especially when the government uh, repeatedly talks about uh, its commitment to the disability rights maxim, nothing about us without us. Well, it, you can't do that if we have barriers taking part. So I, I agree that these things need to be done, not only because they're embarrassing at a symbolic level, but because they're so easy to fix. The barrier you're talking about is not require us to tear down any buildings or adopt any new technology. It's technology we know how to use. Great, thank you very much. Um, you, you had told the Transport Committee in March of uh, earlier this year that you, quote, dread entering Canadian airspace, unquote. Do you believe that other countries such as the US or others have better accessibility standards than Canada? When I go to the States, which I do often, I feel like I'm going through a time machine into the future. I'm actually embarrassed as a proud Canadian to say this. But they're way ahead of us. And it's not because they invented people with disabilities before we did. 
It's simply because at a legislative level, they decided to pass something strong and effective way earlier, like 1990, not 2019 at the federal level, because they put in place effective, much more effective enforcement than we have. Their federal government uh, has much more effective enforcement uh, because they've enacted much clearer, more comprehensive standards. Now, are they the paragon? There's lots they could be doing better, but they're way ahead of us. And with a billion people with disabilities around the world, it means they've got an edge on the, uh, on the tourism market of people with disabilities uh, and, and with uh, uh, the goal of ensuring that people with disabilities can fully participate. They're certainly ahead of us uh, on multiple fronts. We should be catching up. We should have caught up by now and passed them. Thank you. Um, when I asked the Minister of Disability Inclusion in May, uh, when she was at this committee, whether Canadians living with disabilities were facing a cost of living crisis, she she wouldn't answer it. And so my wouldn't answer. And so my question for you is: Do you believe Canadians living with disabilities are in a cost of living crisis and have been disproportionately affected? by the cost of living crisis, and as well, do you think it's more difficult when Canadians um, living with disabilities uh, may be more disproportionately affected with the cost of living crisis, and how, how does this play into um, creating a Canada without barriers, as this study is working on? Absolutely, there is that cost of living crisis when uh, uh, the, the, the Parliament, uh, this committee, and uh, the Senate held hearings on the, on the Canada Disability Benefit. You heard over and over how people with dis, living with a disability cost more. Uh, if you look at what happened during the pandemic, uh, the federal government did a, uh, created a benefit uh, for vulnerable uh, folks uh, across the country, and then it did an, another benefit for people with disabilities, but they, one was a one, once only payment, and it took months after it was created just to get it out the door. Uh, so, yes, this, that, that is a huge problem, but just coming up with a Canada Disability Benefit that's only 200 bucks a month maximum um, really is, uh, uh, shows that the criticisms of that legislation uh, from many of us were correct. We warned that this could happen. It did. And it also shows that those of us who criticized Bill C-81, the Accessible Canada Act, because it didn't impose uh, more deadlines and detailed requirements on the federal government, um, sadly, we're, co we're correct. We don't take any pleasure, pride, or joy in that. We wish we were wrong. We've got about 20 seconds here uh, left. So I'd like to ask, given that the Liberals promised with great fanfare that the Canada Disability Benefit was going to lift hundreds of thousands of Canadians with disabilities out of poverty, uh, do you see this as a broken promise? And also, do you see it being fraught with redundant bureaucracy and red tape for persons with disabilities and those who support them? Well, all the criticisms of the benefit, I think, are valid. But what we also need, well, there's a federal election coming up. I, I, I hear by rumor, you folks may have heard it too, and uh, we, it's going to be important for voters with disabilities to know what each of the parties will do on each of these, on the Accessible Canada Act and the Canada Disability Benefit. Um, and we'd like it uh, to be treated by all parties as a nonpartisan issue because, the, uh, uh, because these laws were both passed unanimous and all parties agreed we needed them. So we'd like all parties to try to outbid each other for what you'll do to fix them. Thank you. Um... Ms. Gray, Mr. Leposky. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you to all of our uh, witnesses today. Um, uh, it was uh, very, um, uh, very interesting uh, listening to your perspective. And uh, I, I will join my uh, colleague to uh, congratulate Mr. Mills on your uh, accomplishment. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Uh, Lepofsky. Um, you talked about um, some of the recommendations that you made. I think there were 10 recommendations. One of them was uh, looking for ways to bring uh, a more uh, coherent uh, enforcement uh, approach. You talked about CRTC, CTA, and I believe the commissioner. Uh, um, can you talk a little bit more about how that would work in regards to uh, your vision of enforcement? Really appreciate the question, um, and uh, essentially, right now the law splinters implementation and enforcement of the three. They each have to make their own enforcement regulations and, and forms and stuff. They each set up their own procedures. They each have 
separate procedures for how they process complaints uh, in their other uh, work, which are very different. So we have to navigate essentially three worlds. And not only that, the same obligated organization can have some of its a, uh, obligations under the Accessible Canada Act enforced by the Accessibility Commissioners and others by the CRTC or the Canada Transportation Agency. It is impossible to figure this out. In fact, the minister then responsible for the bill, speaking to the Senate, gave an illustration of this, which I recall related to airplanes, and she actually got it wrong. And I don't say that to be critical of her. It's to be sympathetic of her because it's so bloody hard to figure out. So instead, how about one agency with a mandate to do all of this work so it's one-stop shopping for obligated organizations and for individuals, one set of reg regulations instead of three. Uh, it, it, it's going to cost us less. And it also has an added advantage, which is that the CRTC and the Canada Transportation Agency have very, very sorry records of implementing accessibility. They've had a mandate not for five years, but for decades, and they've done it really poorly. So can I ask another follow-up question? Sure. Um, I know that there's a, a lot of uh, responsibility that lies within the municipal, provincial level, which, you know, I know you uh, spend a lot of time working on. How do those relationships, the three levels of government, how does that uh, work, and is there efficiencies there in regards to how the levels of government work together? Um, no, and I wouldn't expect there to be, and we should all live long enough for it to happen. So as a practical coalition trying to win results for people with disabilities who need action now, um, our best bet is to advocate to the provinces to handle the barriers they're facing and advocate to the federal government to, adv advoc to address theirs. However, the federal government has an incredible constitutionally valid power to influence at the provincial slash municipal level, which is when you're giving out federal money. When they gave federal money to Toronto to build a subway extension in tw that opened before 2018 up to York University and beyond, they used that money to design subway stations that are replete with disability barriers. Now, it's fr and we put out a video, it's widely viewed online, uh, people can Google uh, David Lepofsky Public Transit Toronto and they'll see these barriers that we filmed and documented and the federal government should be attaching strings simply saying, you want our money? No new barriers. Okay, I think my time is uh, up. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coteau. Mr. Cannings for six minutes. Well. <clears throat> Thank you. It's uh, good to have you all here before us. I'm Richard Cannings. I'm with the NDP, but I'm not the, the usual NDP person on this committee. It's, uh, I'm substituting today, but it's been very interesting here hearing this testimony. I'm going to turn to Mr. Lepofsky, and you said in your statements that you wouldn't have time to go over everything. I'm just going to give you this minute to add anything that you haven't had the opportunity to outline so far. In the 2019 election, the federal government commendably promised that they would apply a disability lens to all federal policies. Require that in the Act. The uh, government in the Senate got an amendment to the bill that actually hurts people with disabilities. It provides that even if you win a case against one of the huge airlines and you prove they got a barrier, if the barrier was actually one that one of the government's own regulations allowed, which no federal regulation ever should, the CTA can't order one penny in damages. They can say, fix the benefit that the regulation should never have permitted, but it can't compensate the victims. That should be out of this act. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cannings. Ms. Falk for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chair. My name is Rosemary Falk. I'm from Saskatchewan. I'm a member of Parliament. And I am a female with brown hair, and I'm wearing a floral dress today. I'd like to thank everybody for um, their testimony today and taking the time 
time to come here. Mr. Lepofsky, I'm going to start with you quickly, if that's all right. Um, again, thank you for your return to this committee and your continued advocacy um, that you are continuing to do with per for people with persons with disabilities. When you appeared at this committee during its consideration for Bill C-81, you had raised concerns that the bill, quote, was strong on intention but weak on enforcement and implementation, end quote. Uh, so five years after the passage of this bill and from your opening remarks, um, would you say that those concerns still stand? Absolutely. In other words, the, the core frailties with the bill are exactly the ones we sought to get identified five, six years ago and uh, sought to get corrected, as did a number of other disability organizations. Yes, and I know we brought forward many amendments um, for, that, for that bill. This whole side of the table um, voted for a lot of those amendments to make sure that there was accountability and enforcement because why are we going to go through all of this work and not have any enforcement or accountability? It, it just doesn't seem like a... a a good use of resources. Um, you've, you've said a few times about this one-stop shop, basically, this agency that, that you suggest would, everything would be there. Would you say that if something like that was implemented, everything else would kind of fit together? Like, would that, that be the most important recommendation, or what would you recommend? There are two things, really, that are at the top of the list. One is that um, and the other is there have to be accessibility standard regulations and forts. Let me make this clear. If you want people to remove barriers, yeah, we could bring human rights complaints and then die of old age waiting to get them heard. Yeah, we could bring CTA or CRTC complaints about the same thing. But instead, the whole purpose for this act, and the minister at the time, Carlo Qualtro, got it absolutely right. We shouldn't have to fight barriers one at a time. Let's pass accessibility standards regulations that identify the barriers to remove and the timelines. That's ex Without that, nothing else does much. And they haven't passed any of those in five years. Accessibility Standards Canada have come up with volunteer guidelines. That's all they could do. Commend them for their efforts. Commend them for doing what they could do. But it, I said before, it's thin gruel. Nobody would obey the speed limit if it was voluntary. Thank you very much. Mr. Lepofsky, a short closing comment. Everything you need is in the nine-page brief that we've submitted. It's been emailed to every one of your offices. It, the government will post it on your website. It's at aodaalliance.org slash Canada, probably the second link. And uh, we suggest the findings you should make and the recommendations you should make. But ask those questions. Are we 25% of the way? No. Have we removed a significant number of barriers due to this act in five years? No. Therefore, the law needs to be strengthened, and we've given you 10 ways to do it. Mr. Long and Mr. Leposky, thank you for appearing again. Mr. Mills, uh, Monsieur Lupien, and um, uh, Ms. Hewitt, uh, Monsieur Salgado as well. With that, uh, this concludes the first hour. We'll suspend for a few moments while we transition to the uh, second panel. Suspend for three minutes.